been doing all your own independent learning recently, I thought I'd come on and take a couple of minutes just to go through one of our topics from atmospheric chemistry, um, namely CFCs, um, also known as chlorofluorocarbons. These guys are fabulous, very interesting chemistry behind them. What you guys need to know is what it stands for. Give two examples, be able to draw the structure of your some examples that you've given. The uses and the issues, because obviously we all know there is major issues with CFCs. So CFC, also known as chlorofluorocarbons. You can see the two examples that I like on the right hand side. Trichlorofluoromethane, so three chlorines and a fluorine replacing hydrogens around the temperature carbon. And then dichloro, difluoromethane, where you've got two chlorines and two fluorines replacing hydrogens um, surrounding a central carbon. So as you guys know, they contain chlorine, fluorine and carbon. And again, in the 19, late 1920s, these guys were discovered and everyone was wild about them because not only were they novel, they had amazing properties. They were low boiling point, low toxicity, low flammability and unreactive. Okay, um, what more do you want in a chemical? You know, doesn't react, doesn't make people sick, doesn't go on fire, and vaporizes really easily. It's the king of the chemicals back then. But as you know, guys, over time they caused issues. Where did they initially use it? So propellant gases and aerosols. It was the gas that was used to pack your aerosol. So for example, the liquid that was in your aerosol was pumped in with a gas under pressure to keep it in there. A foaming agent, basically making expanding polystyrene. It was also used as a coolant agent. So back in the day in your fridges, they used to pump CFC into the metal component at the back, that was the coolant. Um, and it took over from, they used to use ammonia in your fridges. But, randomly enough, was it was unreactive on our surface. Over time, when it was released and entered the Earth's stratosphere, it caused so many different issues. And we're going to talk about those. They're too unreactive. So being unreactive is a fantastic thing, but unfortunately CFCs were far too unreactive. They can travel unchanged. So as a gas, it can enter our atmosphere and then our stratosphere, not a problem. But when they hit the upper stratosphere, there's a high level of UV radiation obviously coming from the sun. And this has large frequencies of energy. And as we discussed um, free radical mechanisms before, this is the same situation. The CFCs needed the UV energy to split and they released chlorine radicals. These chlorine radicals then went on to react with O3, also known as ozone, therefore depleting the ozone there. The problem was, this was not an unusual occurrence once they hit the stratosphere. In fact, it caused an awful lot of damage because they were very reactive. So the chlorine oxide that was produced went on to react with oxygen radicals. Forming oxygen, fine, but then releasing another chlorine radical. That chlorine radical reacted with more ozone molecules, kick-started the cycle. So it's a chain reaction, guys. The chlorine radical is regenerated a lot. And every time it's regenerated, another ozone molecule gets broken down. So one chlorine could actually react with over 10,000 molecules of the ozone. They saw this coming eventually, not so the 70s, but they saw it coming. Um, there was research scientists in California that looked after it. As a result of that, the USA, 
Canada, Norway, Sweden, they all banned them in the 70s. Um, but unfortunately, obviously there was restrictions put on them worldwide, but they're still in dumps. You know, we had to get rid of our waste, our waste refrigerators, our waste um, aerosols, etc. So these were all sent to the dump. And over time, the metal encasing them would rust and break down and the CFCs would be released. Now, they've been completely phased out since 2000, you know, so we have copped on and the ozone has been getting better, but there are still CFCs being released. As you know, about the hole in the ozone layer, it's huge. It's um, mainly over the Antarctic due to wind currents. So the way in which the wind blows, the CFCs travel, they kind of congregate in over the Antarctic. The depth um, of the hole in the ozone layer is as high as Mount Everest. So if you get a lo- chance, have a look. Um, have a look at it, have a look at how deep um, Mount Everest, the height of Mount Everest, and just think about that gap in our ozone layer. And it's as wide as the US of A. So, obviously, air currents really help us in this situation. The hole is confined, but we're also at the moment releasing nitrogen monoxide in our vehicles. This also reacts with our ozone. It destroys it. Mainly comes from the um, denitrifying bacteria that are found around plants, etc. But in current times, there has been a large increase of NOx or nitrogen oxides, NO and NO2, um, coming from industry, our vehicles, etc., etc. And you'll actually notice now with the current crisis that we're going through that um the level of nitrogen oxide being released is low due cause of industry in some cases being shut down therefore it will actually have a positive impact on the ozone layer not great obviously but you know the situation so as you can see o3 reacts with nitrogen monoxide liberating nitrogen monoxide and oxygen. We know CFCs were and are still the main cause of depletion and the methane can react with chlorine to lower the concentration of our chlorine radical resulting in a methyl radical and hydrogen chloride which brings on its own problems as you will know hydrogen chloride dissolving in water results in a very weak hydrochloric acid in this case. Um, If you have any questions, guys, just let me know.